Like, I don't want you to mishear what I'm saying. Number one, you get the sense David has, has, has balling out now. And, and he, he kind of thinks of where he is now in his cedar temple. And he looks down and says, okay, Lord, what can I do for you now? What do you need me to do for you? And God says, let me tell you where I brought you. And it's the same thing I would encourage you to reflect on every week. Like, he lifted you out of the miry pit, out of the ash heap. Where were you? Every one of us, I don't care how good you're dressed today, how sanctified you've become, like, in bondage to the tyranny of sin under the just condemnation of God. That's where we were. Like, not like, you know, I, I, Pastor was mentioning a couple, maybe it's months ago, how we're dead in sin. I remember he's emphasizing grace. Dead. It's not just that we're like floating around. We're corpses. Dead, dead. You're going to hear a reading of the Old Testament in the worship service about the valley of dry bones. And like the, the word goes and then it like, they start coming back to life like that was you and me before Christ. And then he spoke life. And so he's like, David, let me just remind you who you were. I, I've done all this for you. And one of my favorite lines, if you look at what the Lord says um, here. You know, I, I took you from the pasture from following sheep. You should be prince. Now, remember when David followed sheep, he, he had a couple challenging uh, encounters, didn't he? Lions and bears. And you remember when it comes time to take on Goliath. You think of the two things about David. When you think of David, what do you think of? Goliath and Bathsheba, right? <laughs> think of those two things, right? His great mountaintop and then his terrible failures. But for the most part, he, he, he's, an ama he's a solid guy, solid king. Faithful son of God, servant of God. Like, the dances hog wild before the Lord as the ark comes in. And gets clowned by, Beth, by Michael, his wife, like, oh, you're so indignified. And he's like, I'm living for the Lord. I'll devote myself to the Lord. I'll live for the Lord in that way. And so one of the best languages that he gets is when you think when he had to deliver the sheep from the bear or the lion, you think he just mustered that up on his own? He was probably praying, Lord, help me not to get killed. I was cutting down some trees in my yard yesterday, so I cut down this branch. It's like, I had the pole thing. It extends like 30, 40 feet. It's a monster. Branch was way up there, and it's like a spider's. You can barely see. So I cut down this big branch. It must have weighed like 200 pounds. And it, and, it, and it cuts off and falls, but then it's hanging in the tree. I'm like, oh, this is great. I got a 200-pound branch like hanging in the tree, 30 feet in the air. And I got to get this thing down because I got a bunch of kids that go in the backyard. I don't want to fall on anybody, right? So now I got to cut another branch. And I'm talking like I'm extended and this thing's 40 feet. I'm like, you know, sawdust is in my face. I'm working on this thing for like an hour and I'm like, Lord, help me not to die out here. Help me not. No, seriously, I'm calling on the Lord. And it's the same thing with David. Like you call on the Lord and the Lord comes through and protects you or preserves you or answers you. And, and why did he do that? Look what the Lord says. Um, I have been with you wherever you went. Like that, that was my fa favorite verse in Hebrews when I early 20s, 20 to 23. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Whom shall I fear? What can man do to me? You think 20 to 23, a lot of peer pressure, playing college basketball, all the wild stuff people do in college. Like, are you going to live for the Lord? Like, fortunately, I didn't have the personality that was like, overly concerned about what everyone like judged and thought of me. So it wasn't hard for me, but that was one of my favorite verses. Like no matter what people say or do or include or don't include or whatever you see or face in your life, I have been with you wherever you go. God will be with you wherever you go. It's so beautiful. And the thing, the thing that the Lord mentions is I've given you victory over your enemies. Now we haven't been like <laughs> one step away from death more than likely as David was for a good couple years. But God was with him and protected him. And so he's just reminding David because he wants his king like, I'm going to do this for you. God's like, look what I've done for you. Because God wants his king to be what? Humble. Right? He wants his people to be humble. And the way we're humble is if we, if we go back on, on what the Lord has done for us and reflect upon that. And I, I think another way to be humble is to focus on what the Lord will do. All His promises that will even yet to be fulfilled. Like His deliverance from death. The new heavens and new earth. 
Like there's a, there's a funny book John Piper wrote. <laughs> I don't know. All, maybe all of you have great marriages. He wrote like this temporary marriage. <laughs> and it was written for people who have hard marriages. Right? Or you even think of your temporary physical suffering. Like you need these reminders. Not that God has done all this, but that he will marriage is temporary and there's like eternal eternally, uh, glory with God. Or this outward body is perishing. Inwardly, you're being renewed by day by day, but outwardly, you'll be renewed. Like, you need these hopes. Otherwise, you can be, you can despair. So, it's the, the line, the back and forth between the David and his prophet, the prophet and God, and now the prophet and, um, and David through the Lord is just a beautiful line. Let's look at what God's going to do. Any comments or questions? Comment. Yeah. Two Christians who both value what God has done for them, who both see the grace of God upon their lives. One says, I love you so much for loving me because I know me as well as I do. I'm not worthy. You are so gracious to me. I want to do whatever you say because I love you back. So they do these good deeds. The other Christian says, thank you for doing all this for me. I feel like David, I need to repay you. I need, I need to do these same good deeds as my brother did because I owe you that. I mean, I understand David, but one seems to be the right way and one seems to be the wrong way. I'm speechless. Help me, help me understand. You're saying, I, I missed the distinction there. Is, is David wrong in wanting to build a, uh, a nicer place for the ark? Well, it seems like the right thing to do. But he gets it. Yeah, sure. Um, the Lord reminds him that he's never commanded it, though. I think it's important. So as it relates to us, when you think of, we talked about how do you devote yourself to the Lord? We, we just do what he's revealed, okay? We just do like what is written. There's, there's allusions to a temple, obviously, before this. You, go ahead. I think the distinction here is between works salvation and grace salvation. Not, uh, we don't, we may not believe that our works are going to save us, but maybe we think our works are going to, uh, as you said, pay the debt. Um, that we have just not works are going to save me, but just a slightly off view of why we do works. Obviously, the reason is because we love God. That's a good point. So that's one of the reasons. There's so many. We, we Reformed people love to focus on the, the, the way the Heidelberg Catechism is framed. Guilt, grace, grace gratitude. And, and often in Reformed circles, you think, well, just gratitude. That's one and one A. Well, number one, obey because God commands, okay? But obviously, two, well... Because of all the haves that he's done, out of gratitude. Three, I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. It's, it's for your good. It's for others' good. So don't let your motivations for obedience be super myopic. Number one, the Lord commands it. I don't care how you feel. What happens if you don't feel grateful? What happens if you're a little amnesic? You have a little amnesia about what he's done. He still commands, and because he commands, it's good, right, and true. And, and if you just hang out there, that he just commands, and it's good, right, and true, it's good for others, then what happens? You only hang out there. You're not going to have a lot of wind in your sails, right? So gratitude's essential. Looking back to the gospel, realizing who you are as a new creature, spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit has been poured out in our hearts. God shed abroad His love in our hearts through the Spirit, like Romans um, 5. So beautiful. So, I, these silly numbers are up here. Don't just let it be gratitude. What happens if you don't feel grateful? And you go back to the gospel and you still don't feel grateful. And you're just waiting for the feelings to love the wife or the husband. You, you must know the revealed will of God. God commands. And then you, you must really even serve or love and hope. Even if you see it and you're loving your wife, your husband this way, and they're like, Ugh, you know, and they almost gnash their teeth at you. But you're being faithful to the revealed will of God and wisely loving them, right? 
you're still faithful. It's still good. It's still worth it. It's still the right thing to do. So have a little more full orbed uh, reasons. It's hard enough to obey, right? You guys look great, but guess what's within all of our hearts? Sin. Oh my goodness it is, isn't it? I was at Costco. Uh, I, got the, I buy the eggs, you know, I make the breakfast. Um, and I learned from Elder Bruce. We had an elder retreat. This was 12 years ago when I first got here. It was a Saturday thing. I might not even have been the assistant pastor then. And Bruce made these cheesy eggs upstairs in the fellowship room. And he mentioned how, he, you know, on Saturday he makes eggs for his family. And now, you know, well, we're here at the church. So he's caring for us this way. I was like, that's a really beautiful thing. So when I had kids and, you know, moms have a lot going on, I, I started making eggs in the morning. Just about every morning. So I buy these big things from Costco. Big eggs, right? Half of them, you know, a couple times, two or three eggs are broken, four or five. About half of this one was broken. And it's been sitting, taking up space in my fridge because I don't like, I like getting what I pay for, right? And the Costco policy is if you're not satisfied, you, I know the policy. I read it when I go in there. I'm like, what a great policy, right? Unless it's like a TV or some appliance. Like for the most part, if you're not satisfied, you get the return. So I roll in there with my kids. This was maybe Friday night, right? It's late, Friday night, right before it closed. And I've got the eggs and, you know, half of them were good. I ate half of them. Half of them were broken. They're like stuck in the thing and shattered and, you know, and they've been in my fridge for like two weeks. And um, I returned one, a vacuum that broke, okay? This is rarely do we return things. I sound like a scammer, okay? The vacuum broke. I got it for my wife. I got it for her birthday. What a terrible husband. That's not all I got her, all right? That's like, that's like Homer getting Marge a bowling ball for her birthday. You remember that episode? Of <laughs> she wanted one. I got her that. I got her tons of other things, so don't judge me, class, okay? <laughs> but this thing, this thing conked out, so I had to return that and my eggs. Are you taking the eggs back, honey? Yes, I'm getting them out of the fridge. So I go with my kids. And the vacuum, no problem, got the receipt, and the eggs, you know, I have the receipt too, and, and this guy's like, he's giving me a hard time. Apparently the fine print of the policy is that what? Well, you, you can't have consumed more than 50% of the product. I didn't know that, right? And I'm, I'm one egg short of 50%. <laughs> one egg short, it's not a good thing, right? You know, kind of strict sense of justice, even though I'm a man of grace, and I'm like, you jam me up about it. And I'm like, yeah, I just thought the policy was if you weren't completely satisfied. You know, these eggs were like raining on my parade. I was trying to make breakfast in the morning. And, and so he's like, he's acting like he's going to do me a favor. I can do you this big favor this one time and take it back. And I was like, you know, I don't really want any favors. I just kind of want you to stand by your policy. It says if I'm not satisfied. He's like, it's a 50% policy. So I'm like counting the eggs, right? Counting them. No, seriously. Like, you know, what, it's, it's one short. So I'm like, he's like, well, I do you this favor, this one time, this favor. And I'm like, I don't know what that means, buddy. Like, let me take some pictures of this. I don't know if I'm having to escalate this thing or what. So snap off a couple of pictures. I didn't say escalator. And I said, let me get some pictures of this. I didn't know. And he's like, do you want to return the eggs or not? And I said, you know, I wouldn't have brought them in here if I didn't want to return them. You know? And so it's like this big back and forth. I could have just said, yeah, do me the favor, pal, right? But I was upset about the lack of what I perceived as justice. I want the fine print of the return thing. So why do I say all that? My goodness, how did I get on that? It was Larry's comment, right? Larry's comment about why do you do good works, right? Let it be full orbed. God commands it. Oh my gosh, it's for your good. Whether someone gnashes their teeth at you or not, it's for your good. Number three, you should do it out of gratitude. And then what, what else? Well, you're a new creature. You were formed for these good works. And it's so glorious. And so, Larry, it's, it's better. You don't want to feel like God, God needs it. God needs me to do this. Because then guess what happens most of the time? If you're not Christ, you're a little imperfect. And if you think God always needs it, and you're never kind of up to the task, what are you going to be doing? Well, you're just going to put yourself further and further and further and further in debt. And so that's the most beautiful thing about the gospel with David's son as he sends forth the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I often get this in, you know, counseling people are talking to Christians who, you know what they understand about Christ? They understand the cross like nobody's business, okay? They, they get that their sins are forgiven. They get that sins are forgiven. You know, Christ shed his blood and their sins are forgiven. He rose from the dead and now they have eternal life. But then when it comes to works, right, their good works or their Christian obedience, when they fall short, they realize, okay, well, Christ forgives my sins. 
And sometimes when we sin, what happens? We try to atone for our own sin and then we turn away from God until we feel better and then we turn back to God. And that's an example of us doing what? Trying to atone for our own sins. Let me build the own cross of my shame and guilt until I feel better. Who's Lord at that point in our repentance? Our feelings. Yes, us, but our feelings. Rather than the revealed will of God that says forgiven. But remember, the gospel also says that you are what? Completely righteous in the sight of God on account of Christ. Like that God considers you or has reckoned you righteous as if you perfectly love God. Remember Larry's question was, am I paying God back? You can return to the cross all you want and His forgiveness on the cross is sufficient to forgive your sins. But if you don't have an understanding of the perfect... Yes. Righteousness of Christ that is reckoned to you that's imputed to you. The scriptures will close here. The scriptures refer to it as what? Garments of salvation. Who, who likes fancy garments? They don't get any fancier than that. Wow. And you think it's, it's garments of salvation that like clothes you. And it's, in a sense, it would be the righteousness of Christ that is reckoned to you. Because you're unrighteous as you sit here, so am I. Yeah. But you are utterly righteous and righteousness is imputed and reckoned to you for the sake of the one who did love God and love neighbor perfectly. And so that's the perfection. That perfect life of love is reckoned to you. Even if you fall short today, which you will. Even if you feel like you haven't paid God back, which you can never do. The one who, who met the demands of justice for satisfying what God required is Christ and His obedient life. And then His vicarious death. And all of that, Scripture said, was what? Fancy language or for you. Like those are two, three of the most beautiful statements in Scripture. And that's what you have to hold on to. And so, didn't get deep into the Davidic Covenant. Forgive me. We'll resume there, I think in two weeks. We have a great missionary coming next week. Uh, so come to Sunday School, Neil Williams, listen to him. He does a lot of ministry to, to um, Muslims, like all throughout the world. Uh, one of the main guys in our denomination that's in charge of you know, ministry to Muslims. So he'll have a lot to say. And the thing about the, the Muslim religion is, how do you have assurance of your salvation? It's, it's challenging. Like, got to do a lot of good works, and even then you may not know, or commit jihad, or perhaps there's other things. But in the Christian faith, how do you have assurance of your religion? Look to the Savior. Just look to Him. Oh, I did this for you. You needed this? Oh, no, I, I received all this for me because I needed it. And you just embrace that and rest in that. And then you labor from that posture of, of humble salvation to love and serve others. Um, let us pray. Father, thank you for, um, for David's heart, his sincere heart, wanted to do such great things for you. Lord, we all do. And yet you reminded him of where you brought him from keeping sheep, protecting him from his enemies and saying that you've been with him wherever he went. Um, Thank you, not only that you are with us, but that you in Christ have gone before us and faced death head on and, and that the grave could not hold you. You would not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Those are David's words. And so we thank you for the resurrection of Christ. We thank you for um, the life that we have in him and, and the worship that you are so worthy to receive from us, from our hearts, from our lips our minds even this hour and so be glorified in in the midst of your people here in your courts and in your temple in this household of God as we lift our hearts to you in Jesus name we pray amen